Joe. Uh, welcome. I'm Nick Lemon, the Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism um, here. Um, however, if you pay attention to this sign in front of me on the lectern, you will note that this is a uh, SEPA School of International and Public Affairs event in partnership with the Journalism School, which is contributing the, the space. Um, so thanks to SEPA, whose dean, John Coatsworth, is sitting here. Um, and I'm just going to introduce the moderator for the evening and then go sit in the audience. The moderator is Alan Brinkley, sitting here. Um, he is Alan Nevin's professor of history uh, at Columbia until uh, the end of last year, was also provost of Columbia, um, and has himself a new book out uh, called The Publisher, which is a biography of Henry R. Luce that you're seeing uh, reviewed around. Um, so, Alan, I'll turn over to you and uh, welcome Mark and John, and I'll uh, listen with interest. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, and it's uh, a pleasure to uh, welcome uh, John Hallman and Mark Halperin uh, here to uh, Columbia. Uh, and uh, thanks to uh, Nick and everyone who's helped uh, organize this event. So um, this is a, 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 an event to uh, discuss the uh, sensationally successful book, uh, Game Change. Uh, and of course, these uh, two men are its two authors. Uh, and this book uh, has really uh, b broken a lot of new ground in the way uh, journalists deal with uh, elections. Uh, and I, we thought that this would be a good thing to talk about with journalism students and people interested in journalism. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so we're going to open this up by uh, giving each of the, uh, the authors a chance to say a few words about the book and uh, talk a little bit about what um, what reactions they, they want to react to. Uh, and then we'll uh, have time for questions, uh, both from me and from all of you. So let me introduce uh, the two authors. Uh, John Heilman on the left, uh, on my left here. Um, uh, and John is the uh, national political correspondent and columnist uh, for New York Magazine. He's the author of Pride Before the Fall, uh, The Trials of Bill Gates and the End of the Microsoft Era. Uh, and of course, he's the co-author uh, of Game Change. Um, Mark Halperin uh, is editor at large and senior political a analyst for Time Magazine. Uh, and uh, prior to that, I uh, worked at ABC News uh, for nearly 20 years. Um, and um, he was a uh, he received his BA from Harvard and were and was in a class of mine. <laughs> and uh, so it's nice to see him again. Um, so I think uh, we'll start and let uh, whichever one of you wants to go first uh, say a little bit about your book and uh, and whatever you want uh, whatever you want to say about it. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Brinkley. I, it's true that I did take a class at Harvard with uh, the professor was not the worst grade I got there. So that's all. I'll say. <laughs> that's all I'll say. Um, you're all nice to come, and, and thanks to Nick and to both both schools for hosting us. Um, well, I'll just talk briefly a little bit about uh, about the book uh, as a piece of journalism, and um, and then um, John will talk, and then uh, we're happy to take questions. The the reality of of this book for us uh, was uh, a challenge uh, from its premise, because the premise of doing a book about a campaign. Uh, these days is considered uh, questionable as a commercial prospect and even as a as a piece of journalism because we were going to write about the most covered and in some ways overcovered campaign any of us had ever seen. People were familiar day to day, minute by minute, because it was such a compelling story with um, both the plot uh, and the characters. And also, um, uh, there was going to be more of it across more platforms, more media than there had ever been. Um, the last few campaign cycles had not seen a commercially successful campaign book. Um, and so while we talked about it separately, as did almost every political reporter covering the race uh, who ever had aspirations to write a book about uh, noodling about what could be a campaign book that would be successful, uh, until we hit on the idea for game change, uh, neither of us were planning to do a book about the campaign. And in fact, what is surprising in some ways, given the interest that people have had in our book, is there were very few other books written, uh, fewer than five really, of anything like the type of book, a chronicle of what happened 
uh, were done. Uh, almost all of them, all of them really came out before ours. Um, and so uh, the, the, the puzzle we faced, uh, really it was a, a, we came up with the solution before we really thought about the challenge because as I said, although we both as, as most journalists did thought about doing a book, we thought about this book as we were coming back from a, a particularly um, pathetic and, and thus for journalists fabulous John McCain event uh, where he, he performed very badly in a very bad setting and we realized that this was, uh, as we say in the subtitle of our book, the race of a lifetime. Um, that it did have, in fact, uh, an incredibly compelling plot um, with, um, with uh, twists and turns, but also amazing characters. Our standing joke as we wrote the book was if you've got a presidential campaign where Rudy Giuliani is the seventh most interesting candidate, you know you're covering a pretty interesting presidential race. And this was a, a cast, uh, uh, when we thought of the book, that did not include what eventually would, would be one of the more interesting characters, Sarah Palin, but the Clintons and the Obamas and the McCains and, um, and John and Elizabeth Edwards um, all produced for us a, a sense that if we focused on characters, if we focused on the candidates and their spouses rather than the tactics and the strategy and the polling and all the things that were part of the day-to-day -day press coverage, that we might be able to produce a, a book that people would be interested in. Uh, and the, the, the main animating premise for us besides the characters was the notion that there were big unanswered questions about the race. Uh, questions that the two of us didn't know the answers to, even though we had covered the race closely and consumed a lot of media about the race. Uh, why did Barack Obama think he had a chance to win? Uh, what role did Hillary Clinton play in, in or Bill Clinton play in, her, in his wife's campaign? Uh, why did John McCain pick Sarah Palin, a question we eventually grappled with? Um, and, and in all those areas, we thought, you know, uh, the coverage of those questions was, was, was not zero. Uh, but those things were covered, those big questions were covered the way everything was covered day to day. Uh, much the way, to use the, the cliched metaphor, the way second graders play soccer, someone kicks the ball across the field and every player runs around the ball, so you've got 20 players clustered around the ball and, and then someone kicks the ball out of the pack and everybody chases after it. And there's not a lot of follow through, there's not a lot of spreading out and trying to see the whole field. We thought we could do that, we thought we could go back to those questions as after everyone had moved on to where the ball was uh, after the election. Uh, and do a lot of interviews and try to get to the bottom of, of the answers to those questions, again, with a relentless focus, not on the strategists and tactics and all the other things, and not on policy, although we're both interested in policy, but on answering the fundamental question, what, did the can what problems did the candidates and their spouses face, how did they feel about them, and what did they do about them? And to do that, to, to, to try to write that, uh, we drew on what for both of us were 20-year relationships with people in both political parties people who had stories to tell and were willing to tell them to us. They weren't um, uh, interviews, of over 300 interviews that we did. They weren't interviews that were, in almost any case, combative or difficult. Uh, we, we sat down with the people we were interviewing, almost always together, almost always in person, and we asked them to tell us the stories of the campaign. And what was most fundamentally different about this from the kind of journalism that we have practiced now and that mo is mostly practiced in campaigns in almost every else is we had the luxury of re-interviewing people. We had the luxury of finishing an interview, a long interview, and then saying to each other, debriefing each other and saying, well, where does this interview lead? What are the, who are the new people we, we didn't thought of to interview that we now need to interview? Who are the people we've already interviewed that we need to go back to? And again, if you think about it, uh, daily journalism on the web or in a newspaper, weekly or monthly journalism in a magazine, um, that's a luxury that doesn't usually exist anymore. And it's, and it's, it is, it is obviously qualita quantitatively different, but it's qualitatively different too. There really is no substitute for re-interviewing people, in, in, in our case sometimes up to more than half a dozen times. Uh, and uh, you, you, you build the thing in a way that, um, that is cumulative and extraordinarily rewarding to do. One of the great uh, parts of this experience for us was uh, the day we had the conversation in the spring of 2008 about the book and conceptualized it and then had a few follow-up conversations uh, the, 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 the conception of what we wanted to do uh, in the book uh, from those few early conversations is exactly what we executed. Uh, because again, we had a hunch that, that that kind of book, a book that told the story that way in a narrative form uh, where everything was accurate and where we had access to uh, sources across the board would be a book that people would still be interested in uh, over a year after the election. Let me stop there uh, and uh, hand over to John. Yeah, you know, Mark, that's, that's a, a Mark, I thank you first, um, Professor Brinkley, um, Dean Lemon, um, for having us. Um, I'll thank you again. Um, it's an honor to be here. 
Um, and, and Mark gives a great <coughs> overview of, of how the book came about. I, I just, I guess I'll, I'll add just a couple things to that and, and, and then we can move to questions from the chair and from, uh, and from the floor. Um, wh one of the things is that, as Mark talked about, the importance of characters in the book and, and how, uh, how central that was to what animated us and what we thought was interesting about the book. I mean, these were um, extraordinarily uh, compelling characters to the country and, and I think to, and to, and to us as well. And, and one of the things that, that, that really in that first conversation that was uh, compelling to us was the notion of trying to write a political book that was not a political book. And we saw these people as, and wanted to portray them as interesting, uh, compelling, charismatic, uh, powerful Americans in an incredibly intense contest, um, but not necessarily as different from uh, the sim that, those similar kinds of people who would be engaged in a similar kind of contest in other walks of life. So, you know, that, that had a lot of effects in terms of how we uh, reported the book and wrote the book. We were constantly focused, trying to focus as much as possible on the high human drama of what this was like. I mean, for everybody who went through this, it was an extraordinary race. When we started, it was, you know, when we had this conversation that Mark referred to, it was April of 2008. The Democratic nomination fight was not yet over, and it was already the longest Democratic nomination fight that either one of us had ever covered or that the country had seen uh, uh, in history. And so for Barack Obama, for Hillary Clinton, for all the people around them, they had been going through this incredible marathon for, for at that point, 16 months. And you know, we, we described the, 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 the process in the book as being kind of a combination uh, uh, meat grinder flash incinerator. And that's the kind of thing that really does put enormous stress on human beings, on marriages, on relationships. And in the process of going through it, it changed those characters. And those characters uh, changed in, in front of full view of the country. Um, their strengths and weaknesses as human beings were very much revealed. Um, their strengths and weaknesses had a large uh, role to do in, in what the outcome of the race was. And we were very much focused on all of that kind of stuff. We had another standing joke, which was that we wanted to try to stay away from all these things, that, that, that not just strategists and, and policy and, and polls, even though, again, we were very interested in all those things. But there were issues of process that consume enormous numbers of cycles for, uh, for many people in, in our business. We would joke often that it, we, we, would, we were absolutely adamant that we were not going to write about the seating of the Florida and Michigan delegation. Uh, if, we could, if we wrote the kind of book in the Democratic, on the Democratic side, if we wrote the kind of book we wanted to write, that would not be in there. Not because it wasn't important, but because it was the kind of thing that was covered endlessly during the, during the time of the race and, and was the kind of thing that most normal human beings who were not obsessed with politics or people who lived with inside the Beltway really cared about and didn't really have anything to do with the human experience of the people who were running. Um, the, the other thing I'd, I'd say is, you know, that we often would joke in, in, the, in this process in the same way. We often would joke about how one of our cardinal rules uh, in writing this book, and, and for some people in uh, publishing this is apparently a controversial thing, but we sort of had a standing rule which was, if it's not interesting, we're not going to put it in the book. And um, there, are, there are a lot of books, I, I think it's fair to say, in all spheres that, uh, that feel very padded because uh, people put in everything from their notebooks. Uh, they put in everything and try to be uh, to dump as much information into the book, into their books as possible. And Mark and I had a very kind of scrupulous, rigorous view constantly that if, if, the, if the book felt like it was dragging, that the, the importance of the propulsion of the narrative was, was, was high. And if the book felt like it was dragging at any point, we started looking for things to cut. We wanted the book to be, to be true and be accurate and important, but also to have this kind of uh, propulsive effect that carried you through like it was a novel, although everything in it would be, would be the case, would, be, would have been true, factually accurate. Um, the, th the only other thing I'd say, and it's one of the things that's really become clear, I, I think it was our conviction beforehand, but it became really clear how valuable this was afterwards, which is that as we go around the country and talk to people about the book, one of the things that I think has resonated most strongly with people is that it's not a partisan book. That the book um, is not, in, in, in much of political publishing now, if you are uh, Sean Hannity, or, uh, or, 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 or uh, uh, on, the, on the right, or Chris Matthews on the left, or Keith Olbermann on the left, uh, that is a way that you can have a commercially successful political book. But if you try to play it down the middle, you're doomed, because the only people who buy political books apparently are partisans, at least that's the conventional wisdom. What we've heard from people uh, that we've talked to uh, over the course of the last four months since the book came out, constantly is people expressing a kind of gratitude to us for writing a book that was not 
partisan, that was not biased, that seemed to treat both sides of the race uh, with, with, with fairness and, and with, scru with scrupulousness, with scrupulous fairness. Um, no one, uh, we've had people from as far left as you can be to as far right as you can be uh, applaud the book and, 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 and find the book satisfying in various ways. And that in turn has been very satisfying to us because although both of us have our, pol our politics and our political leanings, I think we both think that, that, that it's, there's been a coarsening uh, and a hyperbolizing of the political dialogue that's taken place as what Mark once named the freak show has kind of taken over where you have this shouting match that plays out on cable television and in the pages of a lot of books. We didn't want to have that kind of shouting match in the pages of Game Change and, and we were pretty uh, hardcore about making sure that the book betrayed no kind of ideological bias and I do think that it speaks to something about uh, where the country is politically and, and where and what people are looking for it from the media that people have found it, in fact, uh, gr uh, enjoyable and gratifying to read a book that doesn't seem to be coming from some particular partisan place. Um, with that, I will um, close and, and we can answer any questions, as I say, from the chair or the floor. Well, I have just a couple of questions and then I'll just uh, open it up for everyone else. Um, one question I have, I mean, you, you rely very heavily on interviews uh, and I wonder um, how many of these interviews occurred during the campaign and how many of them occurred afterwards? Uh, because I would think that uh, people working in campaigns would have a very different way of talking about it uh, once the, uh, the turmoil of the campaign was over. Well, we did maybe a quarter of the interviews. Uh, uh, we did the interviews in two, big, in two big tranches. One was immediately after uh, the nomination fights ended. So before the, uh, the, the national conventions in the summer, so late spring and early summer. Um, and then we did the bulk of the interviews after the election. Um, and I, I just I quickly say a number of things about that. One is that um, the interviews were done with extraordinarily care in terms of explaining the grand rules to the, everyone we interviewed. We had a little speech that we would give every time. Even when we re, were re-interviewing someone, we'd meticulously remind them of the rules. And one of the rules was everything in the interview is for the book. It wouldn't be used uh, uh, before the election in the case of the interviews we did before the election. And it wouldn't be used in, on the web or in our magazines or any other way. Um, as I said before, we were interviewing in almost every case, not every case, but in almost every case, people who one or both of us knew quite well. And so um, they had to have that trust in us, uh, particularly in this age where reporters tend to not have as close relationships with candidates and spouses and staff as existed before. Uh, and where because of the web, there is a greater danger uh, with some reporters that you, if they've told something, uh, that, that they might publish it uh, in a way that could affect the outcome. Um, so we didn't really, I don't feel people really held back on us. Um, the biggest challenge really in some ways, again, from a craft point of view, was scheduling. Uh, we were determined to do all the interviews or almost all the interviews together. Uh, and we were dealing with very busy people, even though it was in that relatively slow period after the nomination fights. We were still dealing with people who had a lot to do. And after the election, uh, particularly when it came to the people who were, or many people who were going into the government, um, uh, they were obviously quite busy too. And, and, and all I can say is, what you said at the beginning of your question, the book is heavily based on interviews. Uh, almost all of our, all of our writing is, is directly derivative of the interviews that we did. And, and the book would not exist without the extraordinary cooperation of over 200 people who saw and felt, we were, we're, we were glad to say and, and lucky, uh, that it was an important project and that, uh, you know, in campaigns people don't write very much down. And so this was oral history that would be lost. And, and, and we found even within it for a given individual that um, we'd interview them and then we'd interview them later and often they would forget what they told us or deny they told us something because their memories start to corrode at an extra extraordinarily quick rate. So we're very glad and lucky we got done the ones we were able to do before the election and then uh, because of the timetable we were on, we had to do them in a hurry uh, after the election. Uh, and uh, uh, both, both sets were extraordinarily important because if we'd waited until after the election to interview people about the early part of the process, uh, they would have remembered far less. So the, the principal characters, as, uh, at least in my view of the book, uh, were um, um, Obama, Clinton, Edwards, McCain, and Palin. Uh, and with the exception of Obama, almost every other candidate uh, ended up in some kind of train wreck. Uh, Edwards may be may being maybe the most uh, spectacular of them, but uh, all of those campaigns sort of had a meltdown. Uh, and I, I just wonder 
why you think, uh, or do, do you have a sense of, is this just a coincidence that everybody in the campaign except Obama uh, ran what turned out to be a really terrible campaign? Uh, or is there something about this election that made it ex un unusually difficult for people to campaign effectively? I think there's um, there's some truth to, to both those things. Certainly, the, uh, the the length of the of the process, you know, how long these people had to campaign for, uh, was certainly part of the put, put a huge amount of stress on everyone involved. Um, uh, the, you know, the the extraordinary demands of fundraising, all of those factors. But, you know, I, I think it's a fair observation to say that they were all uh, that that there there were plenty of train wrecks um, in those campaigns. What's interesting about them, I think, um, at least from our perspective, what was so interesting about them was the ways in which the, the, the train wrecks had different kind of characters. They looked different um, uh, di from campaign to campaign, and they were um, very much reflective of the, of the candidates themselves. You had, you know, in the case of, um, in the case of John McCain and Hillary Clinton both, uh, you know, we were both, I think, surprised um, to, to, report it, to, to learn as we reported the book just how ambivalent and how reluctant they were to get in in the first place. And many of the problems that they had in the early goings of their campaign derived directly from their reluctance. They had different reasons for being reluctant, um, but in some senses they were they were they were they were different, but also similar. Um, you know, John McCain very much, especially and especially Cindy McCain, felt very had, had felt very burned by the process in 2000. Cindy McCain was not just reluctant, but opposed to, to her husband running because of what had happened to them uh, at the hands they thought of the of the Bush campaign in 2000 in South Carolina. A very searing experience for them emotionally. Uh, John McCain did not think he would run for president again, and, and when he finally did decide to run was a very awkward and uncomfortable front runner. Um, and, and much of the, of the disarray in his campaign, when his campaign was at its most disarrayish, uh, which was in the first six months of 2007, you know, came directly out of this discomfort that McCain had with having been placed in the role of a front runner, having this edifice of front runnerdom built around him, all of the expectations in terms of fundraising, in terms of building a national, uh, a national organization, uh, taking on this, this mantle of, of uh, in the Republican Party in particular, taking on the mantle of front runnerhood made him uh, awkward because he was the guy who very much preferred to run in a, in a spirit much closer to the kind of person he is, which is a bit more of the, 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 the classic fighter pilot who's, a bit, who's more of a loner, uh, more of a free spirit, not someone who likes structure very much. Uh, and, and he rebelled against that uh, with terrible consequences in those first, in those early months. You know, in Hillary Clinton, you see a, a woman who, uh, in addition to her ambivalence about getting in, you know, had, had seen, you know, the, the disarray in her campaign is obviously evident throughout the book, um, but you, if you look at it, as we did in the book, you, you see the roots of it. She had seen in her husband's campaign in 1992 uh, that a fractious campaign staff, in her view, would, did, did not necessarily lead to, to defeat. Um, she didn't see fractiousness and, and conflict as a problem. And in fact, looking at the 92 model, she saw that a certain kind of amount of creative energy could come out of that kind of conflict. And so she almost intentionally built a campaign in which conflict was at the core. And her, her, her notion of uh, a campaign staff that was a team of rivals, this notion that the people around her would be strong personalities who would duke it out and the best ideas would arise among them uh, was very much to, uh, a purposeful one, it was what she tried to model her campaign on. What she didn't seem to recognize was that in such a model, uh, what's required is a leader at the top who eventually adjudicates between the competing ideas and, and chooses a clear path forward, something she was always very reluctant to do and goes, I think, to some of the, of some of the, the weaknesses in her character uh, that the book exposes and that really plagued her campaign and plagued her, her, whole, uh, her whole run for the presidency. Um, you know, we could talk about the, what, what happened later in terms of the Sarah Palin thing, but there's no better example of a place where uh, the, 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 the personal foibles of a candidate were more clearly played out in the train wreck quality of his campaign than with John Edwards, certainly. And you know, one of the themes, I think, that comes through in the book, and you can see it in all of these candidates to some extent, is this gap between public image and private reality. Um, one of the things that Mark and I heard over and over again with respect to John Edwards, and also in particular with his wife Elizabeth, was that the gap between their public image and their private reality was greater than it was for any other two people in American public life. And the process of trying to manage that gap. And this is one of the places where Obama uh, had a huge asset in the fact that his public image and private reality were much closer uh, than, than they were for many of the other candidates. In, in Edwards's case, the, the attempt to manage that discord um, was all consuming for his campaign and, and, for, and, and indeed trying to manage it for, in terms of his wife. And you can see very clearly in the book the consequences of that 
uh, for, for how he ran. Um, and and I, I think there, there is, you know, there's something to be said for, um, for the notion that character is destiny, but character is also organization. I mean, kind of the, the, the organizations that arise around these people very much reflect their characters, and that's one of the kind of key lessons in the book. Well, let me uh, invite any of you who want to to uh, ask a question. I don't know if there, if there are microphones. Oh, there are microphones. Perhaps we don't need them, but uh, yeah. Oh, that's right. Yes, we're we're being recorded. So yeah, please come up to the microphone. Guys, I took a look at the at the, the book at the book a glance at the book at the uh, booksellers table, and I looked up Rudy Giuliani, and uh, tried to find out why his campaign fizzled. And uh, pages two eighty eight, two eighty nine, and three hundred, and essentially you give four or so reasons. Uh, the Governor Chris's endorsement of McCain, Rudy's wife, a um, couple of other factors, uh, his poor performance in debates, and of course Bernard Carrick. Uh, my question is, uh, have you gotten any feedback from Rudy directly or indirectly as to whether he thought your analysis of the failure of his campaign was right on or not? Thank you. Well, I'd say, I'd say some good indirect uh, uh, confirmation was his endorsement of Marco Rubio a few days ago in the Florida Senate race. <laughs> um, uh, and he said, I, I mean, it, it's more direct than indirect, he said when he endorsed Rubio, amongst the reasons he was endorsing was because of his experience with Governor, uh, Governor Christ in the, in the uh, endorsement process, uh, because as you write in the book, um, uh, just in a classic story of, of how politics works, it, Governor Chris was not seen as a trustworthy figure, even by John McCain, who he eventually endorsed, because he promised McCain his endorsement very early on. Uh, and the governor of Florida, although he's, he's more famous now because of the trouble he's having than he was back then, even as the governor of Florida, that was a big endorsement, probably the biggest of any, of any politician in the country because of the importance of the Florida primary and Governor Chris' ability to raise money. Uh, so he promised McCain his endorsement. McCain uh, had, had taken a risk by endorsing Chris in his primary when he was running for governor, uh, and Giuliani did not. And Giuliani uh, sort of felt he'd missed the opportunity there. Chris, McCain felt that he was going to get Chris's endorsement, just as McCain had endorsed Chris, and, and Chris held back and didn't promise it, and in fact moved very close to, to endorsing Giuliani. So on that on that story, I think um, I think it's safe to say that the, the mayor uh, agrees with our narrative, uh, and 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 the fact that they thought they were getting the endorsement of Chris and staked a lot of their strategy on it is something that that I'm certain he agrees with. So the Rubio endorsement is uh, strictly payback. No, he didn't say it was strictly payback. He. He, no, he also he also said that um, that he thought uh, Rubio was a better candidate for the party. I mean, he he did he, he explicitly said it wasn't the only reason, but it was kind of unusual, uh, I thought, because he could have simply hid behind a, a range of all the reasons that a lot of people are endorsing Rubio now, including the fact that he looks like he's he's you know he's twenty points plus ahead. Uh, so he didn't say it was the only reason, but it was pretty striking that he said it was a reason. Um, you know. Uh, a lot of the people who we wrote about in the book have explicitly reacted, uh, and 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 some have said, like Elizabeth Edwards said, it, the stuff in the book about her is true. Um, the mayor hasn't challenged it. Uh, the other things we wrote, and I'd say um, the mayor is not one who shies from challenging, including people in our business. So I won't say that that means he endorses everything in it. But um, look, a lot of the interviews we did to create the. The, the portions about the mayor, which aren't that long because he's not a major character in the book, uh, were based on interviews with people very close to him and very supportive of him to this day. Uh, and so the, the, the narrative is not based on uh, uh, people with access to grind or hostility. So as, as we are with everything else in the book, uh, with the Giuliani stuff, we're quite fully confident that it's accurate. Um, you mentioned some of the characters' pre-existing flaws as they came into the campaign, but also how some of their characteristics had changed over the campaign. Could you elaborate on that? In the case of Obama, for example, how they would have changed over the 16 months? Or well, I think you know Obama's maybe the, maybe one of the more striking uh, examples. I mean, we uh, the, one of the things that you know, although Mark and I had had covered the the race in the very beginning. Um, one of the things that was very striking in the course of going back and excavating the material that we did for the book was just kind of how bad a candidate Obama was in 2007. 
And you know, I, the, the, the badness of his, the, the superficial elements of, of why he was a poor candidate were pretty evident for a lot of people to see at the time. His, his poor performance in the debates was widely noted that he lost, you know, a, a, and to his, by he, his acknowledgement, his campaign's acknowledgement, he, he pretty much had the floor uh, wiped with him uh, by, Hillary Clinton pretty much wiped the floor with him uh, throughout 2007. He was um, not, uh, for a lot of that year, he was not uh, the inspirational uh, orator that uh, many people expected him to be, uh, given that their first impressions of him were from the 2004 Democratic Convention, where he'd given this incredible speech, which really launched his national political career. Um, I think some of those things, uh, you, you see that they are rooted in, 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 in a, something you actually still see in Obama now as president, which is a certain um, aversion to uh, the, the artifice of politics. Um, you know, he, he, he knew that there was a certain amount of performance involved in, in politics, as every political uh, candidate does. But I think you know, much of, of what he tried to do in 2007 was rooted in a, in a commendable uh, interest in trying to conduct an adult conversation with the nomination uh, electorate. So you would have uh, Obama going to town hall meetings and conducting very professorial, uh, often quite um, dull, uh, long uh, disquisitions on various aspects of policy. Um, in his debate performances, his biggest problem is that he was always trying to, to shove too much information into every answer. You know, his, and he would say this in, as we report in the book, he would say this in debate prep, you know, well, I have 60 seconds for that answer, how much can I get in? Um, which is, uh, you know, the, the, the a kind of classic tendency of someone who's a very smart guy who wants to, to, to answer the question completely and wants to show off his knowledge, but not someone who's necessarily focused on, on making the most effective presentation in that setting. And so I think one of the things that you see uh, as Obama becomes gradually throughout the book a much better politician, you see someone learning uh, a trade, you know, learning a craft, and, and, and making certain kinds of compromises of what he thinks of as the ideal way for a candidate to run in the interest of becoming a better candidate, a more effective candidate, one who connects better with, with, with people uh, out in the, in the country. Um, and I think that change, you see it manifest itself over the course of 11 months uh, in, the, in the course of 2007. Uh, and from really from the early part of November of 2007 when he gave this famous speech in Iowa at the Jefferson Jackson dinner through uh, the key moments of the nomination fight, the direct nomination fight with Hillary Clinton in the, in the winter of 2008, you can see him uh, uh, growing into himself as a, uh, as a public figure and as a, as a politician and, 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 uh, and learning to make the kind of compromises that you need to make between the ideal uh, of what you w would like to present and, and the reality of what actually works in a hotly contested presidential uh, campaign. Hello, my name is Melina. Thank you very much for coming. Um, and speaking with us, I read Game Change for my American politics class and really enjoyed it. Um, I was following the campaign very closely. Did you closely. buy that book or do it as reserve reading? Um, <laughs> I did it on reserve. Um, Just checking. But I, I worked on the Obama campaign in Florida and certainly election night was the climax for, for us and um, for everyone watching uh, the election. And the book, however, I feel didn't pose election night as, as the climax of the, the narrative. And as, I'm wondering um, about your treatment of that. What what, what decision-making went into that? Thank you. Well, that's a, that's a good example of, um, you know, John mentioned before the seating of the Florida and Mission de delegations because of the fight over the rules is something we, we were uh, vowed not to include. Things like election night um, and, and other big set-piece events um, were so familiar to the country. Uh, they're almost iconic moments that um, we, we, were, we asked around about them and we reported on them. But uh, we couldn't really advance that as a story. The emotion involved, the, the, um, the facts of them were so well known uh, that uh, including them in a book of the length we're doing, not a comprehensive book in the sense of every event, including the big events detailed in every particular, uh, uh, was too much for us. It, just, it would have been too long. So um, we had some little nice things about election night in Chicago. Uh, but. Um, but it didn't fit with our premise about how to make the, how to make the book an interesting. And people will occasionally say to us events just like that. Um, you know, why didn't you include more on X? Uh, and again, it was a pretty simple test to go back to what John said. If we couldn't write about it in an interesting way, if it didn't fit with being revealing about uh, about the candidate, a candidate or a spouse, um, it didn't fit with, with with what we were doing. You may want to add to that. 
Well, no, I just, I, you know, I think the, we, 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 made a, we made a very conscious choice about it. And, you know, the, the book has a, a relatively lengthy narration of the last day of Obama's campaign, which I think for both of us felt like the emotional climax in a lot of ways for what he was living through. Um, the, 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 there was no question uh, by that day, um, a, a day where I happened to be, I, I, among the two of us, I happened to be traveling with him that day. It was a very extraordinarily emotional day. His, it was you know, him dealing with the, 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 the death of his, of, of his grandmother and, and, and he was, uh, but, but there was no question in anyone's mind that he was going to win at that point. The, the drama of victory had kind of been drained away and what there was was a, a, this other kind of drama, this human drama of him of him going through that last day, living through this kind of extraordinarily emotional roller coaster, um, closing the campaign in that way felt in some ways more climactic um, than, than, and particularly as Mark, to go back to what Mark just said, you know, the, the, the speech the last night um, in Virginia, I, I, having seen both of them, the, the speech on election night was an extraordinary speech, but in some ways it was the, it was the, the, the first speech of the new administration rather than the last speech of the campaign. And, and because we were also, with the exception, with the sole exception of our description of Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and their negotiations over Secretary of State, because that was such an important emotional um, uh, and psychological uh, episode in the book, we, we really kind of wanted to end the book on, a, on what felt like the end of the campaign and not, um, and not be casting forward uh, into the new administration. And, and if you remember the speech on election night, as emotional as it was for a lot of people in the crowd, one of the things about it was that it was a very sober speech and not an exultant speech and not a speech about victory so much as it was a speech about the, the new responsibilities that were now on his shoulders going forward. A very powerful speech, but a speech that came out kind of thematically didn't feel as much like closure um, as, the, as the one the night before uh, in Virginia had. Uh, my name is Christian. I'm a student here at the Journalism School. Um, just had a question. I was wondering if you at, at any point were concerned that the book might uh, kind of skew unfairly uh, in favor of Obama in that, uh, you know, people who had worked on the Obama campaign were, at, were afterwards mostly working in government and therefore might be less likely to kind of dish the dirt on the campaign as, as someone who perhaps was in the McCain campaign would be. Um, never once. Um, and again, I'll go back to something I think I've said twice now, which is because we know these people, um, you know, uh, I won't say I won't say the portrait of, of Barack Obama is negative, but there are I'd say as tough things about him and how he dealt with people uh, in our portrayal of him as, as almost anybody has written about him uh, from, uh, from an objective journalistic point of view. Um, uh, and uh, again, I'll, I'll use the phrase that, that appears in some of the critiques of our book: this notion of talking to people with an axe to grind. Um, we didn't put anything in the book that was based on, only on sources who were, felt negatively towards the person they were talking about. Um, uh, the reality of, of, of the other portraits is the, is the reality of what happened based on talking to people, some people who may, maybe have a quote unquote axe to grind, but, uh, but also people still very favorably disposed towards the people they were talking about. Um, uh, and, you know, if we had gone and tried to write a book about uh, of like this in this style of interviewing about an area we don't know as much about show business or, or, or Wall Street, uh, we'd be starting from scratch with people and trying to evaluate them. But one of the responsibilities of a journalist and, 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 um, and, and, and uh, uh, methods, if you're doing it right, is to be able to evaluate people. Not every sentence from source A and source B should be treated the same way. You've got to put it in the context of who they are and what they think and what they feel. So there's no question that um, the portrayal of Barack Obama is, is uh, he comes off as a better guy than John Edwards. Uh, but I think the country probably has a pretty firm agreement at this point that he is, in many ways, a better guy than John Edwards and most guys. And um, and uh, and I don't I don't think read in its totality uh, that uh, I hope at least that the portrayals of anybody are unfair. I think they're all fair and 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 complete and based on again a lot of interviews and and uh, with as John said before a real effort to be not just scrupulously fair in terms of accuracy but not partisan or or taking cheap shots at anybody. Hi, uh, Ken Favreau. Um, a couple months ago, um, you may have seen it, Peggy Noonan uh, did a column in her weekend, uh, did a, uh, published one of her columns on the weekend in the uh, Wall Street Journal. And uh, it was her reaction to reading your book. And uh, if I read her correctly, um, her takeaway was these are not noble people in a noble pursuit. 
And uh, so kind of a two-part question. One is, do you, did I read her correctly? And two, do you agree with that assessment? Well, I, as I remember that column, and, and I confess that my memory is not uh, perfect, but I, I thought her point more was that everyone in the book was crazy. Um, uh, and, and it wasn't a question so much about nobility or ignobility as about insanity and sanity. Um, and I, to, to the extent that, I, look, I don't think that, that you can put yourself through this process without a certain uh, amount of lunacy, you know, and, and certainly a lot of, um, uh, you know, all of these candidates have this mixture of, of qualities. Um, they are all, to some degree, very needy. Um, they are all, to some degree, uh, quite grandiose. Um, there's an enormous amount of ego and vanity in, in all, um, in, in anybody who thinks or, or, or purports to be suitable to being President of the United States. Um, it's certainly true also that some very extreme, that in some of the cases of some of these candidates in, in, that you see in the book, there's some very extreme and behavior that, that strikes one as being um, uh, a little unhinged at times. And, and I, I think Mark and I both put that down to the extraordinary pressure that these people were under um, throughout the course of the campaign. But amidst all of those qualities that I just mentioned and amidst all of that, some of that behavior that seems a little, um, as I say, a little unhinged, you know, I think there's also an enormous amount of, and I'm, I know Mark agrees, there's an enormous amount of nobility involved in, in, in the pursuit of this office and in, in, in the pursuit of public service. I think at, at the core of what uh, drives all these people is the desire to try to make the country better. And, and, they, and they may be um, egomaniacs to think that they're the person who's best able to deliver that, but there is a nobility to it. Most of them could be making a lot more money doing something else, um, and instead they decide to, to put themselves in, in, the, in, a, in, a, in a situation of extraordinary scrutiny um, where it's very hard to have a normal uh, personal life, very hard to have a normal marriage, very hard to have a normal family life under the relentless glare of the media. Uh, and they're doing it largely because uh, they think that they have a vision for how to make the country better. So um, uh, I think it's a, they're, that they're all a mixed bag, but um, uh, amid the, the, the many qualities they have and, and, and some, um, some qualities that are not so, so, so pleasant or pretty, there's also this, uh, this core degree that's very, very honorable uh, and very noble. And I think that's true of really everybody in the book. I don't, I, even, even the candidates, um, even some of the ones who, who in, in our book who, who come off the worst, I don't think that I think there is somewhere deep down there, even in John Edwards, there's a core uh, of nobility about having done what he did uh, in trying to run for president twice. i me just add one, one thing, a, a point that I feel really strong about. John and I both care a lot about our business as a, as a business. We want journalism to be able to succeed in, in, as, a, as a commercial enterprise, but we also care about the standards of our business. And we knew if the book had any success whatsoever that people would scrutinize the methods we used in all sorts of ways, how we did the interviews, uh, the tone of the book, how we treated the characters. And, and one thing that I think is incredibly important is um, we can be cynical, like most people and most journalists, but we did not approach the characters in a cynical way. We, we know them all uh, and have covered them all, and, and some better than others, but, but have an appreciation for all of them as people. And, and the fact that they do put themselves forward to do this incredibly difficult thing, physically taxing very hard on themselves and their family. And so, you know, Cynicism can be in the eye of the beholder, but, but we, we really tried to write about them all with uh, empathy and with understanding for what they were facing rather than what a lot of journalism, a lot of political journalism is now, which is very cynical uh, and, and, and questioning the motives of people all the time. I'd say just, just to single her out, because I think it, it, it's, it may be the clearest example, is Hillary Clinton. Uh, someone who we both know and, and have covered for a long time. Uh, some of the earliest readers of the book were people who, um, uh, before it was published, the few people who, we, who showed it to were people who weren't particularly favorably disposed towards her and had a pretty cynical view of her. And they felt uh, many of them came away with a view, a more favorable view of a broader understanding of her. And, and we hope we, we did that for every character, but that was certainly our goal and to not treat them as people who were unworthy or, or unnoble, ignoble or, or um, or in it, in this, simply to amass power or to, uh, or to feed their ego. Hi, um, I'm a second year at SEPA, and I was just wondering, um, from a journalism, a journalist's point of view, why you think Obama was so effective at getting his message across as a candidate, and then not so much in his first year of office? Well. Um, uh, there are a couple different answers to that question. I, I, and I would first, first refer back to an answer that I gave a little while ago, which is that I think it's, it's true that for much of 2007, it's, it's, a, it's a, 
a trick of the memory to, to, to assume that Obama was effective at getting his message out for much of that year. And, and you know, when, when we looked up at, in, in October of 2007 and, and Hillary Clinton was ahead by 30 points in the national polls, um, there were an awful lot of Democrats and some people inside Obama's world who felt that um, he was not succeeding at all uh, in getting his message across and that he had been uh, actually, that he was in fact the problem, that the campaign had extraordinary success in terms of fundraising, extraordinary success in terms of organization, that the, can that the campaign was extraordinarily good and the candidate himself was not that good. Um, and particularly on the question of having, of having a message that was, um, that was, that was effective, um, both a positive message and a negative message. Um, uh, it's certainly the case, I mean, if you want to go into the weeds about, 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 a little bit into the weeds, I mean, one of the things that made Obama so effective um, in terms of his message when he got, when he became effective, and as we point, we paint it very much in the book, was when the moment when, came when he decided to effectively go negative against Hillary Clinton without really trying to, without, without looking negative. And a lot of that was rooted in the fact that the people around Obama were great students of the Clintons. Um, some of them had worked um, for, for the Clintons, had seen, um, had access to, to, to data. Uh, having worked for the Clintons, that that knew where that they knew where the soft underbelly was um, of of Hillary Clinton and of her husband to a large extent, and they were uh, uh, very uh, astute and careful in being able to craft a, a message that framed Hillary Clinton in very negative terms without ever really attacking her uh, in a in a straightforward way. Um, uh, Obama was very good at speaking in code in ways that would raise uh, many doubts and, and, and stir lots of some of the negative feelings that many Democrats had about the Clintons without ever feeling as though he was like taking a meat axe to her. Um, that, that, w when he finally got there, that degree of precision and subtlety was, was hugely important within the Democratic uh, primary nomination audience, the nomination electorate. Um, I think that the, the broader question, though, that goes to, to the question of today, um, you know, Mark often says that, um, that, and I agree with this, that, that presidential candidates um, do exactly as much as they need to do to get elected and, and not one iota more than what they need to do. And in, in, it, from, seen from 30,000 feet, a lot of what this election was was um, uh, Obama in the nomination battle having to be not a Clinton. And then in the general election, trying to be trying to present himself as not, not not a very difficult task, but present himself as not a Bush, or someone who looked like Bush, or was a Bush inheritor, or a Bush uh, a Bush uh, um, clone, as they painted successfully John McCain. What 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 he did not have to do, unfortunately for him, I think, was do something that Bill Clinton um, in 1992 and Ronald Reagan in 1980 did extraordinarily well, which was to take a um, a, a very clear uh, ideological set of ideological convictions that they had come to over the course of 20 years of kind of marinating in the juices of their party's uh, debates. Take that, that core set of convictions and marry them up to the set of policies that they proposed and put together um, a theory of the case, you know, or a narrative about where the country was, how the, their, their merger of, of core conviction and policy was the, how to knit that together to make a coherent story about how that was the right thing to take the country forward. Obama never really had to do that, um, and he succeeded without having done it. I think it actually was, has been, pro was been problematic for him in his first 15 or 16 months in office. Um, I don't think so far that we can say Obama's been a failure. He's had difficulties. He's had some huge successes. But one thing that is notable is that to the extent that he has problems is that he is in the, in the odd position of having most of, among his supporters, of having people who are on the left side of the Democratic Party think that he is an appeasing centrist, and people who are on the centrist on the centrist side of the Democratic Party think that he's uh, gone far too far to the left. There's a profound confusion still among, I think, the country at large, and and certainly even among Democrats who really want the president to succeed. There's still a great confusion about who he is, what his project is for the country, what Obamaism represents, and I think it goes back to this fact that he didn't have to do that during the, during the campaign, that he didn't have to spell that out in a very clear and compelling way. And I think that, at, at, that it, is, it would behoove him and he would, it would help him politically um, if he were uh, able to do that in a more clear, uh, concise, and compelling way than he's had to do so far or that he has been able to do so far. Uh, Mr. Halpern, I'd just like to, I'm uh, Jeff Roberts, a journalism student here. I'd like to uh, ask if you can speak briefly about your experience going from ABC The Note to The Page and your sort of multimedia gambits. Um, I admire enormously your political analysis, but sometimes I get a bit suspect of your sort of motives as a journalist, but it's nothing new. I'm sorry, sometimes but, you what? 
I, I, I'm not being cute. I, sometimes you get. I, I sometimes wonder about your motives as a journalist, but you are very good at what you do. But it seems you've almost invented branding yourself as a journalist across different platforms. What, what do you suspect me of? <laughs> um, no, I'm serious. I'd love to know. OK. Um, I, I had a nice question, I swear. I, I mean, is it, it, OK, <laughs> if it's on, it's on. Yeah. Opportunism sometimes, because with a, a, a will to win, I mean, you seem you know, pumping for Carl Rove and friends, then the switch, she always seems to be on the winning side. But your political analysis is the best on the web. So, But my question is actually, if you can just please describe the transition to the page, what you see working in the business of journalism, video or online. Sure. Or you seem to be one of the first to go across all the platforms. So. Sure. All right. Well, I won't, I won't uh, risk boring everyone with the, talking to you about my motives and, and uh, my journalism, uh, unless, uh, unless you want to follow with that. I'll answer your other question. Um, I think that um, being a journalist, the most important thing in whatever platform you want to be on is learning how to write. Um, even if you're in broadcast, uh, learn, knowing how to write is really the, uh, every journalism student I ever speak to or student of any, in any business you want to be in, but certainly in journalism, knowing how to write is really the most important thing. I think that the, the reality is, you know, ABC News, where I worked for 20 years, wants to be in the print business because they want a successful website that requires a lot of print content. And Time Magazine wants to be in the streaming video business because they know that there's going to be more revenue that comes with, um, with that uh, increasing uh, consumer interest in video on the web. So there's not a news organization in the country, you know, big news organization, and even a smaller ones, where there's not a, a great interest in, um, in, in content that runs the gamut from print to audio and video and graphics. And I think anybody who wants to be a journalist today, uh, wherever they want to work, you need to, you need to be, uh, have a lot of different skills. You need to be a utility player and excel at as many things as you can. Uh, uh, and you do need to have your own brand um, because uh, that is the way things succeed these days. It's always been to some extent true um, at ABC News. Um, uh, when I was there at the beginning, Rune Arledge was incredibly sophisticated at finding brands like Barbara Walters, David Brinkley, uh, Peter Jennings, Ted Koppel, to, uh, to be brands within the ABC brand. And, and the best brands, individual brands, are ones that are excellent, and produce content that consumers are interested in, and have a relationship with the larger corporate or institutional brand in which they're working. And I think uh, to the extent I've had success in two different places, it's because I think they're both places that value quality content. Uh, and I hope I'm producing quality content. Um, uh, uh, and, and also um, the, uh, a, a use of a medium, in this case, in both the cases you cited, the web, where um, you take advantage of the medium uh, to appeal to advertisers and to consumers uh, rather than feeling the medium is a burden or something that you have to do because it's a medium that exists and, and requires content. Uh, and so both of those products I conceived of uh, because I thought they would they would find an audience in that medium, and and I felt I could produce that content uh, competitively against other people. Hi, um, I had one of the things I'm most most interested in in journalism is media analysis and criticism. And what I found remarkably fascinating after the election was a panel that you two were both on. At, I think at the end of November, where you said that this election was, or the, the media coverage of this election was the most abject failure since the invasion of Iraq right. um, in terms of the pro-Obama bias for whatever reason. I right. think that there was, John had said that there was an intelligence factor in the campaign right. and I was just wondering where do you see the media now right. after the election? Stand aside while I answer so I can make eye contact with the previous question. So you're saying this was a case where a guy had just been elected president of the United States <laughs> It's an extraordinarily powerful position, and he's coming into office. And I went out and I said that the coverage of him during the campaign was too soft and was a big failure. So this was not a case where I was sucking up to somebody who was ascendant or siding with the winners, right? <laughs> right? No, I know. Just, just food for thought for you, for your, for your point. Yeah, I've got to defend myself. I like your work. The only reason this was in my head was because I first discovered you with the note, and I was a bit of an engineer, and I, th I swore you were like a Karl Rove-like Mandarin. 
And then my boss, who was a PR person, said, no, 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 he's in the tank with the Clintons. Yeah. And then you put out this book, and someone up here is accusing you of working for Obama, so you're probably doing something right. All right. I, I've got a recent example of that I'll tell you afterwards, because you've got a particular interest, but I won't bore everybody. I'll, you know, John and I both felt um, that there was a, that there, and other people have said this, that, that the coverage of Obama was too soft. And, and if, you, if you press David Axelrod or Robert Gibbs or give them two martinis, they would admit that. Um, and there's a variety of reasons for that. He was the best story. Um, he had good relations with reporters. He was running, in the case of the Clintons, against someone, against a couple who the press had turned on long ago in, in almost every instance. And then against McCain, someone who used to be a darling of the press, but because he disappointed a lot of reporters, including some liberal reporters, um, he was seen almost in a more negative way than, than a typical Republican. Um, so I don't think there's any doubt that in every cycle, one candidate rises above the others, maybe not throughout the cycle, but during periods where they're getting really softer coverage for a variety of reasons, some, some understandable and, and maybe even justified and some not. Uh, in this case, I think, it, it, again, I think by any objective standard, Barack Obama got um, coverage that, that was not as tough. Um, John has said, and I agree with him, that um, Clinton and, and McCain got tough coverage, but it wasn't overly tough. The scrutiny was, was what it should have been. It's just Obama never got tough scrutiny uh, in, the way, in the way that they did uh, about his background, about his qualifications. And, and um, uh, you know, the Clintons in particular uh, felt really strongly about it. And, and it got inside their heads and kind of discombobulated them. So it, it, it had a spillover effect, not just Obama getting softer coverage, but the Clintons really uh, becoming a, a little unhinged over it in a way that affected their performance. Yeah, I, I would. I mean, I I would only add to that just that you know there's a, you know, for every presidential camp candidate, you know, the 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 care and feeding of your public image is one of the central um, supreme uh, objectives and goals that you have. And part of doing that well is recognizing how um, narratives work, how kind of meta narratives that are out there in the press, how that works. And, and part of that is not just recognizing what your positive narrative is and, and pushing that, but also recognizing what negative stereotypes might exist about you in the press and avoiding those things. Um, for McCain and for Clinton, they seemed either, in many cases, to either be blind to, to those negative stereotypes or they understood them but still continued to do things that fed those stereotypes rather than, than, than blunting them. Um, one of the things that, I mean, I, I give the Obama campaign credit in some sense because their, their, the, it was not just that the press, uh, for the reasons Mark said, was inclined to be softer and more favorable to Obama, though I think it was, but the Obama campaign recognized, um, it fed that in, in a, and it stoked those flames in a, very, uh, in a very crafty way in some cases and managed to steer the press towards the, the negative narratives about their rivals and steer them away from some of the possibly uh, possible vulnerabilities around Obama's own narrative. So the the, the management of press relations that the that the, the on the, in terms of the, the quality and skill between the three campaigns was markedly different. And, and the Obama campaign not only got uh, uh, more favorable coverage, but had a very strong hand in engineering that that coverage. And and, and to the point of of, of the Mark's initial to, to joke about 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 Robert Gibbs and David Axelrod and how they would admit this under uh, under a th under threat of perjury or, or or under the influence of of alcohol, you know there is a scene in the book I think that speaks to this as clearly as almost anything does. You know where uh, on the day before the Texas and Ohio uh, primaries. Um, Obama is in the middle of uh, one of the periodic uh, spasms around, around Tony Resco, and uh, he does a media availability, I can't remember exactly where, but in one of those two states, um, where he is, um, I, I, we, at the time when we saw this happen, we thought it was a moment in the campaign that was rather extraordinary, and then looking back on it, we thought it was more of a moment, but where he's asked, um, he stood up in a media availability and he's asked four or five or six questions, and uh, he answers each one of them in a kind of perfunctory way, and as he's about to walk away, having answered all of five questions, was it five? Five questions. He walk. He's about to walk away from the podium, and there's this group of reporters who are very upset about the fact that this is a big news day. Um, there's some Resco-related news that they want to ask him about, and he's basically just blown them off completely. And he's walking away from the podium, and they're all yelling, "Wait, you can't leave! You can't leave! You you need to answer our questions." And he very frustratedly. Um, 
uh, with this attitude, with this look of complete dismay on his face, uh, as if it was uh, ridiculous that anyone could be treating him this way. So he says, guys, come on. I just answered like five questions. <laughs> and you think about um, uh, uh, presidential candidates who, by that point, Barack Obama was the front runner in the Democratic race. Um, you know, front runner scrutiny uh, generally has kicked in long before then, and you've become acquainted with the notion of the fact that you can't just stand up in front of a media availability, your first one in probably two weeks, and blow off uh, reporters that egregiously, and then you know, just walk away and, have not, and expect them not to press you. In fact, not only did he not expect that, but he actually got flustered and kind of upset and peevish about the fact that he was being uh, treated that way. And I think it actually went, it spoke to at that moment just how unused to, that far into the campaign, how unused to the notion of being treated in a halfway aggressive way that he was in terms of the press. And you know, you still, there, there are other examples, that's probably the most vivid, you still in some ways see it. I think it's one of the things that's been hardest for him getting used to as president is that he's finally started to get scrutiny that's appropriate to the, to, to the office or the position that he has in the political world. And just to go back to your question, I'd, I'd add that into one reason he was more successful as a candidate. He's now not only getting tougher coverage from this quote unquote mainstream press, which he almost never got as a candidate, and he's never gotten it. It's like no one in our lifetimes, our, our, our professional careers at least, have gotten to the White House with such little negative coverage. And he's now getting attacked by the right wing freak show, which happened some during the campaign, but it's much broader. It has a much bigger audience. And, uh, you know, McCain kept some of the right wing media organs from really going after Obama because they were too busy going after him. They were too busy going after him. And they were so <laughs> ambivalent about him and about the contest. And, and Barack Obama was rising above some of the, uh, some of the things that are, are, would bedevil any Democratic president. Now, now he's not. And he's not used to it. He doesn't much like it. And he's much more like. Um, Bill Clinton and, and to some extent George Bush, according to people close to him, where he now says things like, the press doesn't understand me, the press never gives me credit for what I've accomplished. He never had to deal with that in the campaign. Last question. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, it was mentioned earlier, uh, Giuliani's um, endorsement of um, Marco Rubio. And it was interesting that this was mentioned because um, a lot of uh, commentators in Florida, uh, among them George Bennett of the Palm Beach Post, have written uh, how, um, sometimes uh, almost jokingly, but how despite the differences in ideology, uh, the campaigns of Marco Rubio and Barack Obama are very similar in the narratives they present, like they're both the son of an immigrant, they're both the underdog. And um, in terms of the endorsement, it was also true that uh, in the beginning, Obama didn't have as, man, uh, as many endorsements, and now Marco Rubio as well, he's getting a lot more endorsements uh, now that he's um, leading. So I was wondering if you share this view and if you believe that there's a sort of almost conscious effort by Rubio to imitate some aspects of uh, Obama's campaign. Um, the short answer is yes. Um, you know, um, particularly uh, uh, this notion, which is very hard to do, and they're both very good at it, of being for change, that's relatively easy. Being against the establishment, but being optimistic. I think, uh, I think Marco Rubio has become, like Scott Brown, a, this vessel into which much too much is being poured in terms of both uh, uh, what they've done and what it means and also their possibility as national candidates. But Marco Rubio has, and Scott Brown, both are able to talk about the Republican ideas and conservative ideas and about changing the status quo while still being optimistic the way Ronald Reagan could, the way Bill, Bill Clinton could, the way Barack Obama could. And I think, I think that similarity is, is is not just natural. I think Rubio has, has adopted uh, some of that in a way that, um, that is, is very shrewd. And I'd, I'd add only to that that you know, one, of the, one of the dynamics that really comes through in Game Change is that uh, you pointed out that, that at the beginning Hillary Clinton had more endorsements and Obama had fewer. We, you know, we reported in the book how much of the establishment was actually you know, behind Obama, but just secretly behind Obama, that they wanted the Clintons to lose, and they were waiting for the right moment where it was safe to come out and, and be for Obama. There's a certain similarity in, in this case also, because th there was, I think it what has been revealed as the Republican establishment has moved into Rubio's column, is not just that they're moving there because he's a winner, but also they had very little loyalty to Charlie Crist. And although they might not have been secretly rooting for Rubio, the, the, the making of, ending up in that column is not a painful thing for them because their, the level of loyalty that they had uh, uh, to Governor Christ was, was not high to begin with. And I think there's a certain similarity there between the way the Democratic establishment was, not, was ostensibly 
for the Clintons, but in fact, um, on a deeper level, had no real ties to them and didn't particularly care um, if Hillary Clinton won or, in fact, would have actually preferred for her to lose. Well, let me just uh, say a word before we st stop. I, uh, it seems to me that, that campaign books are a kind of genre that is fairly new, uh, starting maybe in 1960 with Theodore White's uh, The Making of the President in 1960. And in that book, uh, the focus was, was on John Kennedy and Richard Nixon. Uh, and they were treated with great reverence in that book. Uh, but it nevertheless was a book about the candidates. And there were other characters, but that was really what the book was about. Then uh, you look forward a few years, and starting with maybe Joe McGinnis, campaign books start to be about the handlers uh, and about the tacticians. And you know, maybe the most obvious example of this is the, the war room, the the, the documentary about the Clinton campaign in which um, Clinton makes cameo appearances in the, in the very beginning and then is rushed off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all Stephanopoulos and, uh, uh, and Carville. Uh, and with maybe the exception of Richard Ben Kramer, I, I, I can't think of, a, of a, a, a campaign book after 1968 that really took the candidates themselves entirely seriously um, I think your book did. I think your book is sort of returns to the candidates, and, and I think that's a very healthy thing. Um, and uh, I think we've heard tonight uh, a lot of very interesting questions about candidates rather than about tactics and strategies of, of uh, campaign handlers. Um, so thank you both for coming very much, and thank all of you for coming. Uh, there are books in the back uh, that uh, I, I suspect the authors would be willing to sign. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you very much. Thanks.